Hi guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the ASRock X570 Tai Chi motherboard. So, um, I'm not really sure what the price point is supposed to be for this board, but it, it does look like a pretty solid board, so we'll go over it, and when it, when it comes out, you can, you know, look at this video, look at the price, decide if this is the board for you. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the GN Store. The best way to support our independent reporting is through store.gamersnexus.net. This is made possible with your purchases of merch like our GN Media Mod Mat in stock and shipping now and designed with GPU teardown diagrams and grids. Our 100% custom-made two-tone shirt is also a great way to help and it's currently on sale. The shirt uses 95% cotton and 5% elastane for a sporty fit with vibrant colors and was designed entirely by the GN team. Learn more at the link in the description below or go to store.gamersnexus.net. So let's get right into it and we'll start with this because this is the first relatively high-end X570 motherboard that I've seen that doesn't have an entirely unnecessary extra 8 pin. Um, fun fact, even if you have like the lowest, ver uh, the, the cheapest, lowest current spec version of a 8 pin power connector, it can still handle 384 watts of power. Unless you have a Ryzen, uh, Ryzen 3016 core, you're not getting even close to this amount of power consumption. And even on the 16 core, like this would very likely be, uh, it, you would only hit that kind of current draw on voltages are, that are not safe for long-term usage. So really not a concern the, the, to like, so, so basically, you know, the, the, the fact that this board has an 8 pin plus a 4 pin does not make this motherboard any, in any way inferior to the motherboards that have two 8 pins because you're never going to need the second 8 pin. Um, well, okay, maybe on liquid nitrogen it might be beneficial to like plug in an extra 4 pin, but for daily usage, definitely like the boards with a single 8 pin or 8 pin and a 4 pin or an 8 pin and another 8 pin doesn't matter. One 8 pin is more than enough, especially if your power supply comes in actual like 16 gauge cabling, because if the, the motherboard uses the high, uh, high current version of the power connector, then one of these connectors that can handle actually well in excess of 500 watts as you end up with uh, 13 amps per pin pair um, for the high current term uh, for the high current version of the connector and uh, well at 13 amps per pin pair you can do the math I, I haven't actually written it down in my notes but 13 times 4 times 12 and you're going to arrive at the the kind of power you can push through one of these eight pins uh, if your PSU is up to like it is up to the task but um, yeah. Um, really not a, like, for daily usage, this is just a, not a concern. On something like X299 or X99 or X79, uh, it becomes more of a concern because those CPUs pull far more power than, like, mainstream Intel or mainstream AMD CPUs. But, uh, yeah, here, like, the, 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 the extra 4-pin even here is unnecessary, it's just that. Uh, I appreciate that we have a, you know, motherboard where they don't go all the way to two full, like, a, a whole unnece unnecessary 8-pin, because I think it's just silly. Um, and it also leads to, like, some really um, dumb comments on the internet, which is the main main reason why I cover a lot of things. It's just like, when, well, I, I, as soon as I don't have to read those comments anymore, I, I'll stop talking about those kinds of things. So anyway, moving on, we have a BIOS flashback button. Um, then we have a clear CMOS button back here. So this is obviously super handy if you have your motherboard installed in a case like a normal person and not like me. Um, I use test benches, but if you have your motherboard installed in a case, uh, you know, obviously having the, the clear CMOS button on the rear I.O. makes it much more convenient to recover from any kind of major overclocking fails because you don't have to open up the system just to get at the clear CMOS jumpers, uh, which you do have, or uh, the clear CMOS button. There, there's both here. You also get a postcode and a power button and a reset button. There's no dual BIOS. There's no real, like, advanced extreme overclocking features on, on this motherboard, so you just kind of get the bare minimum for... Well, not the bare minimum. Like, th this is, for an ambient overclocking target-focused motherboard, this is more than enough as far as I'm concerned. This is not, uh, well, there's motherboards that are better equipped if you wanted to actually go for, like, liquid nitrogen overclocking because uh, you, you start getting some extra requirements where you run into issues where, you know, if you clear the BIOS on some motherboards, that means you also have to go and uh, pull the whole system up to uh, warm temperatures because you won't be able to post at low temperatures, so... Uh, yeah, th this board obviously not meant for that, um, but at least you do have the 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 minimum for sort of, you know, he well, it's not m minimum, but the standard for like proper uh, ambient overclocking support. Um, the only real complaint I have for the postcode here is that it is under the last PCIe slot, which 
Like, the, tons of boards do this, and it's always in my, like, the, the postcode should be somewhere where you can see it, even if you have all your GPU slot, like, all of your PCIe slots fully populated, right? If you put three GPUs on this motherboard, or you buy, like, one of those M.2 SSD cards with a fan in it, and, you know, th there's a few of them that are actually quite long, it'll end up covering, uh, covering up the postcode, and then it's just like, well, you, you won't be able to read it, so that, that won't be very helpful then, will it? So... Yeah, but anyway, we do have those kinds of features here, so, you know, at least they're present, even if they're not implemented to my expectations. Um, but that's mostly because ASRock is actually keeping this motherboard in the standard ATX form factor, so there really isn't any space, like, in the usual area for, you know, overclocking features. There, there's just not any space, because ASRock decided that uh, they want to have better case compatibility, so this board ends right after the ATX screw hole. Um, whereas there's a lot of boards that even at this sort of price, I assume at this sort of price range, which actually end up being like this, this wide. And with some cases that can potentially be an issue. So yeah, like, you know, it, it is a like, as far as I'm concerned, it's still a compromise that I'm not a fan of, but I, I can kind of understand why, why they're doing it. Um, anyway, let's move on to the VRM. And uh, the VRM is a 12 plus 2 phase configuration, which is actually less phases than what you would get on like an uh, X470 Tai Chi or an X370 Tai Chi, as those were 12 plus 4, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, that really doesn't matter because uh, the plus, the, the SOC VRM, right, that power, like, it is only really a concern if you're running a uh, APU and not a CPU. So obviously, this board is meant for. Uh, is primarily meant for CPUs, and it does have an HDMI output, so you can run an APU on it if you want to, but it, it like it just doesn't make sense to put an APU in a board like this, and then actually use the iGPU of the APU to like render your 3D like games, right? Like that. That's the main thing. Is like if the iGP if you're not actually using the iGPU, then the SOC VRM is kind of irrelevant. So the SOC VRM really only matters if you're going to be really pushing an iGPU. Um, to very high, well, not even really high clock speeds, it's just like, if you really want to max out the iGPU, you need a, you could benefit from having a more powerful, like, a uh, higher phase count SOC VRM, but, uh, like, the, the, this board's really not meant for that, so I don't really see any issue with, uh, with what ASRock has done here. And, uh, in terms of the control scheme for the whole VRM, we are looking at a ISL, uh, 69147, uh, which is actually a new chip. I've not seen this chip used on any other motherboards yet. Um, and this is a seven phase voltage controller from Intersil. Um, it's AMD specific, which is just kind of interesting because uh, most other boards will go with like an IR35201, which works on AMD. It also works on Intel. This chip is uh, AMD exclusive. It does not support the Intel voltage regulator standards at all, which might make it a little bit cheaper, I guess. Um, but uh, anyway, so here it is running in a 6 plus 1 phase configuration, so the method that, you know, ASRock uses to get this 12, uh, 12 plus 2 phase VRM is, of course, a array of doublers on the back of the board, and we need to wait for GIMP to do its thing. Otherwise, it's going to be laggy. There we go. I don't know why, why it's doing that. It might, might be just had it to open for too long. But uh, anyway, so we have one doubler for the SOC VRM over here, and then we got 1, 2, 3 four, five, and six for the V-Core. All of these doublers are the same chip, so these are all ISL uh, uh, 6617s from Intersil again, and the cool thing about this doubler is that this actually does current balancing, so uh, it gets you slightly better efficiency than if you just use a non-current balancing uh, doubler, because basically these will monitor the current going through each phase, and they will extend or shorten PWM pulses depending on which uh, phase is doing more work than the other phase. So, yeah, that, that's really, really cool. They also have the option to run as, uh, to run both phases synchronized, so no doubling whatsoever, um, which it's not really doubling at that point. It's like, the, not really phases. It's like run the power stages uh, synchronized, so you basically have one phase, except with, uh, like, there's no... I, I, I can't actually think of a single reason why, if you have a 6617, why you would run it in that mode, because it doesn't really achieve anything uh, <laughs> if you run it like that. But uh, if, if you are running it as a doubler, you can also have it as doubler without the current balancing enabled. So as a bunch of configuration options, it's a it's a far more advanced doubler than what you get with like a IR3599, which 
Um, you know, the main focus of a 3599 is the fact that it can also quadruple. It's not that it's the, the best, uh, smartest doubler ever created. So as far as like doubled 12 phase VRM schemes go, this is one of the, well, basically the, the best one that I'm aware of. Like you can't, I can't really think of any doublers that uh, do what these do. There's other doublers that will do things like fa uh, pulse skipping to try to regain current balance, but nothing that will actually extend and shorten your PWM pulses in order to get proper current balancing cl like you would if the f controller actually supported 12 phases on its own. Um, well, there's some limits on how much it can extend the pulses, but still, more be better than what you'd get with a lot of the other doublers out there. So, Control scheme in, in my book is perfectly good here. There's nothing to complain about. Um, and then for the actual power stages, uh, so this whole VRM seems to be kind of a really like bang for buck solution because um, with the, the power stages that uh, uh, ASRock has opted for, they're using SIC uh, 634s from Vishay Semiconductor. And uh, these are 50 amp uh, DR MOS parts. And what DR MOS stands for is driver MOSFET. These are as dumb as it gets when it comes to power stages because there's literally all one of these chips is, is two MOSFETs and a driver IC. Um, and actually it's not even an IC at that, yeah, a driver IC. Um, so basically, they don't do current monitoring, they don't do temperature monitoring, they don't do anything internally, um, which does make them really, really cheap. You can get the SIC634 for like a dollar a piece in bulk. Um, actually a little bit less than that, but it's, it's around a dollar, whereas some of the smarter power stages you're looking at, you know, two, three, four, even five dollars for something like an ISL 99227B. Uh, and then there's, you know, the SIC634, you get a really powerful 50 amp, uh, you know, it is rather powerful at 50 amps current, uh, current output handling capability, but uh, it's also really, really cheap because it's a bit dumb. Um, not that that's a real issue. It's like, honestly, things like overcurrent protection and over temperature protection being built into the power stage, as far as I'm concerned, is th like, those are things you need if your VRM is not quite big enough to power the, th like is borderline able to power the thing you're powering, right? Um, if your VRM is significantly more powerful than the highest power consumption, you know, you're ever going to be actually running through it, then you don't have to worry about an overcurrent event because there's not going to be one because you're never going to overload the power stages, right? Like the OCP is there if you exceeded that 50, cur 50 amp current draw, but this is a 12 phase. That's 600 amps uh, total current output. So, you know, with a Ryzen 3000 series CPU, you don't need OCP on a power stage like this because you'll never ever get close to that kind of current output in this kind of VRM. Now, if there was four of them, you know, it might be actually useful to have over temperature and over current protection because you'd be running really close to the limits of what these power stages can actually handle. But as it is, it's just like, yeah, you, you've got great efficiency and they're a bit dumb. Who cares, right? You can still do cur like the current monitor, the, the voltage controller still has current monitoring because that like basically what, what happens when you don't have the current monitoring and temperature monitoring built into the power stage, you just have to build your own circuit externally somewhere on the board, which isn't as accurate as some of the current monitoring systems integrated in some of the latest power stages, but uh, it's a lot cheaper. So yeah, um, bang for buck kind of ERM solution here. And uh, the end result in terms of efficiency is that for 1.2 volts out output and 500 kilohertz switching frequency, um, this VRM is going to do 100 amps output at about uh, 10 watts of heat dissipation. Um, then 150 amps output, it's going to do about 16 watts of heat. Um, going up to 200 amps output, it's going to do about uh, 24 watts of heat and going up to 300 amps. So the, the thing is, is basically this is the range in which a Ryzen 3000 series CPU might actually run. So like the 16 core is probably going to max out approaching 200 amps, a little bit below that with all probability. Um, and then if you're looking at like a 12 core or an eight core, you're going to be looking at 150 amps or lower because in fact, like even on a, if, if you took like a 2700 X, which up until like, uh, the 2700 X is the highest power consumption CPU on AM4, um, until we see the 12 core and the 16 core, um, and the 2700X, if you actually ran 150 amps into a 2700X for an extended period of time would degrade very rapidly. So 
yeah, th this VRM, you know, cover like within the normal operating range for Ryzen 3000 series of CPUs, like th this is more than enough, right? Actually, for any Ryzen CPU, you're basically looking at ambient cooling. You're going to be looking at sort of not even the 200 amp range. Like this is like 16 core only. Everything else is going to be 150 amps or lower. And so there, this VRM does really, really well, right? You don't even for even for the 150 amps output, this VRM wouldn't necessarily need a heatsink as that's only 16 watts of heat coming off the entire VRM. It has a good amount of power stages, right? It has a, it takes up a good amount of surface area, um, so it should be able to shed that heat all on its own, if, as uh, like even without a heatsink potentially, depending on your case airflow conditions, right? Um, and of course, uh, Azrock does actually ship this board with a heatsink. That heatsink is actually rather substantial. Um, so it doesn't look like the, the worst heatsink I've ever seen. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Steve will get a review sample of this board and, it, and he'll do a test or somebody else will do a test. But on paper, th this looks rather solid. And uh, in the current range that I would expect a CPU, like a Ryzen 3000 series CPU to run at on ambient, this board has you covered. Like, it's really not a problem. 24 watts does actually need a heatsink, but again, this is a 12 phase. It's spread across a good amount of surface area on its own, so it's not as bad as when you have, like, because there's 24 watts on a, like, a four phase motherboard, which is not that uncommon on a lot of the uh, X470 boards, especially the cheaper X470 boards. You'd be looking at uh, actually 24 watts at a lower current output as well, because this VRM is far more efficient, but um, there you really, really need a heatsink because it's a four phase, not, you know, a 12. So, um, still. So basically, th this is a really solid VRM for just your day-to-day -day overclocking. It's just not the most insane one that we've seen on X570 so far. Now, going up to 300 amps output, which is like LN2 overclocking territory for like 20... I I'm not even sure 2700X can hit that. I think it barely scrapes into that, uh, like barely does over 250 amps. I don't think it even quite reaches 300 amps on liquid nitrogen. Um... And then if you're looking at the 16 core, I'm not actually sure what, what that'll hit, but it might be able to do 300 or maybe even more than that. Um, but this board would uh, not be the ideal selection for that kind of load, as it would be producing about 44 watts of heat at that point. And that's uh, heat sink and airflow required territory. Um, then going up to 400 amps, uh, you'd be looking at about um, 71 watts of heat and 500 amps about uh, 86 watts of heat. So basically, you know, like in, in the theoretical range, this board is not ideal. But for where I assume, like, obviously, Azrock means, like, as far as I can tell, Azrock uh, intends this board to be sort of like a, uh, a lower, like, mid range. It's basically a really mid range board, right? It gives you a really good mix of basically everything. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, there, the VRM is perfectly adequate and really, really capable. And then it's like, of course, it's not going to it's not going to compete with some of the, you know, 14 phase uh, VRMs that we see on like the, the flagship X570 motherboards. So, yeah, really not about a not not a bad VRM that Azrock's gone for here. I don't really have any complaints. It's not the most powerful, but it's also definitely not the worst. I mean, uh, there are de like, yeah, th this is a solid VRM. <laughs> There's not much else to it. Now, the SoC VRM um, uses more of the 50 amp Vish ADR MOS components, um, and we're not really going to uh, talk about the SoC VRM efficiency. This this voltage regulator doesn't need to push anywhere near as much power as the V core, so this is going to be fine. This is quite frankly overkill. You can build significantly weaker phases and still run an SoC, v like still run the system of a uh, system on a chip portion of a Ryzen CPU just fine. So, uh, no no concerns with that from me. And that pretty much covers the, the CPU power delivery. I mean, uh, it's not the best, but it's definitely not the worst. It's actually, you know, I, I think it hits kind of the sweet spot for what you want to have in terms of a VRM for a, for a Ryzen 3000 series CPU because you get really, really good efficiency in the sort of current range. Well, 200 amps pushing it a little bit, but definitely in the sort of reasonable end of the current range, this, this is really, really solid. So, yeah, um... Nothing, no complaints from me for, for this VRM right here, um, considering, you know, what I assume this board is targeting in terms of its, uh, specific, like, in terms of its, uh, sort of, like, target audience or whatever. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um... Moving on to the memory VRM, so ASRock is one of the manufacturers that just insists on doing two-phase memory power, so... 
we have that. Um, the MOSFETs are dual NFETs from a Fairchild Semiconductor, so those are FDPC uh, 5030 SGs. They're not the best dual NFETs ever created, but DDR4 really doesn't pull that much power, so it's not an issue. The controller for them is a uh, UP1647, I mean, wait, 1674P, and that's a two-phase. So th this is a real two-phase memory VRM, um, which, yeah, like, they're... This is more than enough memory power for really anything. Um, the main concern with DDR4 is basically what happens between the C CPU socket and the memory slots. And in that department, I mean, if we look at the back of the board, we can actually see it, which, right, it has to load. My, my daily system is a pile of garbage. <laughs> anyway, but if we actually look at the back of the board, we can, uh, actually, can we? Oh, that's interesting. I thought this was going to be a daisy chain board. But it looks like they're doing T topology because you can just about you can just about make out this trace, how it goes here, and then it goes one back and one there. And so there's your there's your T topology T right there. Now that's interesting because as far as I know, Azrock really likes their daisy chains, at least on Z390. So I did not think. Yeah, so we can only see this memory channel here and yeah, that's a that's another T right there, right? You can see that trace comes in, doesn't actually connect to anything. There's a little junction and splits like that. We can so that's a T topology. That's really really interesting. I did not think anybody would run a like even Gigabyte has gone to like freaking daisy chain. So I thought it was just going to be everybody doing it now, but it seems like Azrock decided they want to be special. So um, well, that that does make me wonder. So the, the thing about the T-topology memory layout, because I didn't know this was a T-topology. I was convinced this was a daisy chain. Um, and I'm, I'm writing that wrong. Uh, so T-top. Um, so the, the thing about the, uh, day, like the, the T-topology layout is it works really well if you're running four sets of, like four sets of memory, uh, well, four memory sticks, not four sets of memory sticks. That doesn't make any sense. That would be like eight memory sticks or something. Um, but yeah, it works really, really well if you actually, po well, it's optimized for uh, fully populated motherboards. So I guess this might be a really good board for like four, like it, in theory, this should be really good for like four by eight gigs, four by 16 gigs and uh, four by 32 gigs, which I guess makes sense because, uh, well, no, because this isn't the creator board, right? Like Azrock has a different motherboard that's like targeted at content creators. And it's just like there, it makes sense to have support for the biggest, baddest uh, amount of memory you could possibly have. Um, because the thing is, T-Topology straight up sacrifices some memory speed on 2 two by 8 2 by 16 and 2 by 32 configurations. So um, yeah, that is that is interesting. I really thought this was going to be a DC chain. And then I look at the back and it's like, wait, what? That's a T-Topology. Um, so, yeah, um, basically, like, the so with T-Topology, I've already seen somebody do um, on a good T-Topology memory layout, like 3600 megahertz across 32 gigs of RAM on Ryzen 2nd gen. So with Ryzen 3rd gen, this could actually turn into, like, making this board really, really good for people who want to run, you know, 32 gigs of RAM or, like, high quantities of memory at relatively high speeds. This should work really, really well for that because Daisy Chain tends to... Like daisy chain BIOS is towards two DIMMs only, so yeah, um, that is that is very interesting though, because I I was like I would have thought if Gigabyte's decided to go daisy chain, then I I would have thought Azrock would do like everybody would at that point, because Gigabyte is like the only one on uh, X470 that runs T topology. Actually, I wonder if that might not. Be oh man, okay. Uh, and end of like no more tangents um yeah so memory uh, memory configuration is t-topology so you like it shouldn't hurt too much on two dims but it's definitely not going to be ideal on two dims and the the difference you can see on two dims with on like a t-topology board is anything from like you, you can see something like say 4000 megahertz on two dims versus uh, 4200 megahertz on four DIMMs or 40, 4300 megahertz on four DIMMs, depending on how the T topology is implemented on also what the memory controller can do. So that example I just gave is from like Z390. Um, I'm not sure how it works out with the new memory controller on the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. It might turn out to be absolutely terrible under all circum like under all conditions, but, uh, well, um, you know, you, I, I'd hope that Azrock would have like tested the memory layout and then changed it if it didn't work. So 
M maybe this works really well, or at least better than what I'm expecting. So, uh, yeah, uh, that that is still interesting. So this is a T topology board, um, and that pretty much covers everything I wanted to talk about in this video. I mean, we've done the uh, we've done the VRM, the memory, the little uh, various overclocking features. So yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. Uh, and if you'd like to, uh, you know, support Gamers Nexus, you can. Uh, like support Gamers Nexus more direct, uh, whatever. There's store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up some Gamers Nexus merch. Uh, and if you'd like to support us directly and don't want to buy anything, there's the Gamers Nexus Patreon. So there's links to both down, down below the video. Um, and those do help out with the channel immensely. And uh, if you'd like to see more content from me, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do overclocking things. That's literally all the content on there is just overclocking things so yeah that's it for the video thanks for watching and uh, goodbye